Hello wonderful person, this is Anton and welcome to Mars. Today we're going to be talking about the history of missions to Mars with a focus specifically on Russia. I'm going to explain why in a few seconds, but first let's begin with this short video I have right here. Can you actually guess what this is showing to you and what is actually happening here? You may already know what this particular event was or what this is showing. If you don't know anything about this, check out the video for this uh, particular event in the description below. It is actually totally worth watching. It's about an hour long video, but it talks about a mission known as Mars 500. This incredible mission happened back in 2011 or about eight years from when I'm making this video. And I believe I may have even applied for it. I don't exactly remember if I actually went through the whole process of applications, but I was kind of curious to participate in this. Um, because this was when I was actually right after I tried to switch my careers. This mission was basically a kind of an introduction to what it's like to live in complete isolation for 500 days. And um, these people got paid for basically being kind of like lab rats. And they stayed in that particular location somewhere in Russia. I don't exactly remember where it was. Uh, essentially showing us what it's like to uh, potentially live in these isolated conditions. Now, this, of course, was when Russia was specifically interested in going to Mars. And um, they still kind of are. There's still a talk of uh, maybe even beating the Americans to being the first to Mars. But Russia does have a very unique and very interesting history with missions to Mars. As a matter of fact, um, of all countries that ever attempted to, to be on Mars, and there's not that many actually, but uh, Russia has the worst record ever. Um, Russia has a lot of failures, and this is why there's really no Russian missions that have ever succeeded for longer than a few seconds on the Martian surface. There's only three missions that had partial success. And of all of these missions, which I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, uh, there's only one that actually was able to return any kind of useful data. The Mars 3 mission that was launched back in 1971 uh, was actually able to survive on the surface for um, something like 20 seconds and was able to transmit this. Yep, that's supposed to be the surface of Mars or at least some kind of a signal coming from Mars. And that's really all uh, Soviet Union got from this particular probe. However, Mars 3 was actually a really interesting mission. Here's a, an animation made in the 70s that demonstrated what actually happened here. So the parachute would slow down the descent, then the actual descent module would be um, slowed down further with a rocket engine. And then you had the, the, this egg that actually landed on the surface, bounced around. And once it was in a stable enough con um, condition, it would actually just kind of um, open up. And uh, the egg was supposed to contain the actual camera module with this little rover guy that would move around and take some photos and transmit them back to Earth. It actually was a very sound mission. It, it was very, very interesting, quite brilliant. I even saw the mock-up version of this particular probe with all of these specifications. But of course, things go wrong. And in this case, the probe didn't survive for very long. And the Soviet Union had a little bit more luck with Mars 5, which was the orbiter that took about 60 photos of the Martian surface, uh, but then was um, disabled by something. And we think it was actually a micrometeorite. And the chance of that happening is pretty low. So that already kind of goes to show you how unlucky in some sense Russia was. And it all began with Karabl 4 and Karabl 5. Uh, this was back in 1960, way, way, way before the moon landing, when the Soviet Union decided to launch this probe to Mars. And unfortunately, it actually didn't even leave Earth. As a matter of fact, the spacecraft exploded in the Earth um, atmosphere, destroying everything. And the same thing happened with Karabl 11 uh, two years later. So um, basically, this probe was doomed from the beginning. And then they tried again in 1962 uh, with Mars 1. They thought that maybe by renaming this, we'll have better luck. And they did, but there was a communication problem. Despite a huge antenna here, it um, wasn't really working properly and uh, may have actually been misaligned. And so this mission uh, had no communication and basically was abandoned as well. And so they decided to try this again. The Karabl uh, mission was launched yet again in 1962. This was Karabl 13. And yet again, unfortunately, the mission failed and the craft fell apart on the transfer orbit to Mars. 
So two years later, Soviet Union decided to create a new mission called Zond-2, and uh, it was very similar to some of the previous missions, but had more advanced communication satellite. And ironically, this also failed. And so this mission was not able to communicate with Earth. And uh, even though this was supposed to be a flyby of Mars, it never really worked as planned. And at this point, it became a kind of a mini race with NASA, who was launching its Mariner missions. And so uh, about five years later, Soviet Union tried again with this much larger, much more complex mission known as Mars 1969. There were actually two launches and two probes, but both failed on launch yet again. And at this point, I think someone in the Soviet Union must have thought they are cursed because every single mission kept failing. A much cooler, much more advanced mission, uh, Cosmos 419, was launched two years later, 1971, also failed and uh, was actually stuck in orbit of Earth for a little bit and then crashed back to Earth. But prior to the somewhat successful Mars 3 that I previously mentioned, Mars 2 uh, had very similar parameters, but the actual egg-like apparatus crashed and um, was essentially destroyed on landing, so no useful data um, was uh, acquired. However, this was the first sort of partial success, I guess, and it did kind of motivate the Soviets to persist even more and try to launch a few missions following this. And once Mars 3 was actually able to transmit just a little bit of data and I guess showed that this kind of technology could potentially work, Mars 4 mission was launched, very, very similar to this, but yet again failed, this time completely missing Mars and not even landing anywhere. So that was quite embarrassing for the Soviets. And so they tried this mission a few times actually, and unfortunately, pretty much most of them failed. Mars 7 also missed uh, Mars completely only a few months later after Mars 4 did. And so I think at this point, most people would actually just give up. They would totally forget about it. They would not even try, but not in the Soviet Union. They were competing with NASA. They had to prove themselves. And so they kept creating new missions and launching more spacecraft. And so a decade passed and the Soviets launched uh, the Phobos 1 and Phobos 2 mission. This was actually an extremely, extremely interesting mission where the idea was to study the moons of uh, Mars specifically this moon right here, Phobos, and the, the idea here was that uh, it would be a flyby and a potential landing as well. But unfortunately for the Soviets, uh, this time the computer failed, and so both Phobos 1 and Phobos 2 missions were um, failures by the time they got to Mars. And then the Soviet Union ended. But Russia didn't stop there. And as a matter of fact, they tried again eight years later with uh, the mission known as Mars 96. In 996, they launched um, yet another mission. And interestingly, it was based on all of the lessons from the previous experiences and had similar designs as well. As a matter of fact, the actual orbiter was based on Phobos um, from 1988 and was an extremely uh, expensive and also very complex probe with uh, some of the parts from um, other European scientific communities. And it even included a lander very similar to the original Mars uh, landers that was supposed to actually study quite a lot of things that the InSight mission to Mars is studying right now. It even had a very interesting penetrator probe that was supposed to uh, drill deep inside Martian surface and essentially study a lot of uh, things that inside probe is doing right now. But it's always about the weakest link. And the weakest link here was the proton rocket right here. Unfortunately, uh, the stage separation didn't really complete correctly and also one of the stages didn't fire. And so uh, this beautiful probe that you see on the screen right here was supposed to be the salvation for the Russian missions of the past, but it wasn't. It also failed, and um, unfortunately, this was the end of the Russian attempts to bring anything to Mars. This is not to show that they're not going to try again, but it is to show how extremely, exceptionally difficult it is to get to Mars and how to actually land anything on Mars. When it comes to space exploration, no other planet has actually spurred as much excitement as Mars has. And uh, the famous Carl Sagan once said, Mars has become a kind of a mythic arena into which we have projected our earthly hopes and fears. It really shows you how, despite all of the failures, we just keep trying and we keep trying and we keep trying. And luckily for NASA, they're the only ones who have successfully landed every single uh, scientific probe so far. 
And because of the difficulties involved in landing anything on Mars, this is why it's kind of stressful to watch these guys try to actually communicate with the probes and waiting and waiting for the actual landing to occur. And you probably remember this moment when they got really, really excited about the actual landing. When it actually happened, NASA was going ballistic. It was such an exciting event. And that's because this officially gives NASA 8 out of 8 for landings on Mars. We have Viking 1 and 2 back in 1976. We have Pathfinder mission in 1979. Spirit and Opportunity missions in 2004. Phoenix in 2008. And uh, Curiosity in 2012. And lastly, Insight in 2018. Uh, this really shows you how exceptionally well NASA has uh, perfected its skills at landing things and how um, well really difficult it is because the Soviets could never really do it correctly. Now, that's not to say that uh, they were behind in terms of technology or uh, understanding of how to land on objects. It's just to show you how difficult it really is. And um, the only country to actually have completely 100% success in terms of launching um, anything to Mars or really having missions to Mars is actually not America. Uh, the Americans do have a lot of failures on Mars as well. It was this, the Indian Mangalyan probe that was launched in 2014 and created a record for the cheapest mission to Mars. As a matter of fact, as I mentioned previously, it's cheaper than the movie called Mission to Mars. It was only $70 million to launch the probe it's uh, fully functional, it's still operational, it has uh, actually been a tremendous success for the Indian space uh, program, and most importantly, it actually now has created a lot of new understanding of how to launch a successful mission to Mars. And following this, a lot of people now expect India to be one of the first countries on the planet, because they are definitely excited about uh, the new interest in space exploration, and most importantly, um, they're also capable of creating these incredible missions with absolutely stunning success rate. Their uh, missions to the moon have actually been very successful, and now uh, they're obviously planning more in the next uh, few years. And so, in summary, out of about 50 missions in total, only about 20 were actually partially successful, and only about uh, 15 or so were completely successful. So this is an extremely difficult project, it's an extremely difficult uh, planet to get to, and if we're going to be sending humans here, we have to be very, very, very careful. Um, and this is actually why many people think that SpaceX may be rushing into things with their mission to Mars, because as of today, uh, not a lot of success has been seen, even from really, really big organizations like NASA. This, of course, doesn't mean that we should not consider the mission to Mars. It just means that we need to really plan it super, super carefully. On that note, that's actually all I wanted to show you in this video. I really wanted to talk about why there are no Russian missions here and emphasize the idea of the difficulty of getting to Mars and uh, landing on Mars. On that note, thank you for watching. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Uh, come back tomorrow to learn something else. Hopefully you enjoyed this video, and if you did, don't forget to subscribe, like this video, and maybe even share this with someone who you think may enjoy watching videos about space. Space out, and as always, bye-bye.